exhaust valves, exhaust flapper valves, and exhaust butterfly valves. They're just some of the names given to describe this unit down here located on almost all of our modern motorbikes. So in this episode, we've got quite a lot to go through. Uh, we need to understand what is the real reason why manufacturers have to fit these valves. Uh, and also to support that, what I'm gonna do in a moment, I'll show you some footage. I'll take this top cover off. I'm gonna put a camera on there, go for a ride so that you can actually see what is physically going on with the valve while we're out on the road. But on top of that, I'm gonna overlay a, a second camera image of the dashboard so that we can understand in what the valve's doing in relation to gear selection, vehicle speed, engine RPM, and importantly, throttle input, so that we can finally completely understand what is really happening with these valves on this particular bike. So to make this episode as easy to follow along as I can, we're gonna break it into three chapters. So in the first chapter, I'm gonna remove the end can and explain to you the different configurations of what you might find on your motorbikes so that we can see the valve in operation. Then we're gonna explain uh, the real reason why manufacturers have to fit these valves. Then I'll show you the footage of the, of the valve working in real time out on the road. Then in chapter two, we need to look at the cause of some of these problems. Now the valves start off with sticking, and then if you don't do anything at that point, they end up seizing. So I'm gonna show you some preventative maintenance, some basic care that you can do with some simple products and some simple tools of how you can prolong the service life of your valve. Uh, and also uh, the true cause of the problem. And from my experience, as an experienced mechanic with over 40 years of working on cars and motorbikes, I can tell you that the, the reason that's quite often given is not the true reason. So I'll share with you from my perspective what the cause of the problem is in the first place. And then in chapter three, this is the big one, delete it, remove it, disconnect it, or just leave it alone. There are so many opinions about what you should or shouldn't do with your vows. Uh, there's quite a bit to cover in that topic because not always deleting or removing the valve will give you any improvement whatsoever, but sometimes, and this is true, sometimes there is a big benefit to removing or deleting these valves. So let's get started at the very beginning, chapter one. So first of all, I've got the camera focus set so that you can see deep inside the rear of the exhaust and you can hopefully make out that honeycomb looking surface deep inside the exhaust. Now that is the rear exit surface of the catalytic converter and it does look like a honeycomb surface. Now it's important we don't touch that down there and don't worry the screwdriver, although it's very long, is not long enough to get down there and touch it, but we do not want to touch that or introduce any dirt or debris that would affect or touch that catalytic catalytic converter. So what I'll do next is I'll change the focus of the camera so that we can look at the valve and the mechanism on the top. But before we move on, a couple of important points to just make you aware of. Up here, these bright shiny nipples, these are the ends of the control cables that are normally attached to this mechanism on the top, which I've removed so that I can show the operation of the valve. Bear in mind, it is vitally important you do not turn your ignition on or start the motorbike with these cables, these brass ended cables disconnected from your motorbike because it will pull up an error on your dashboard which on the Euro 5 bikes and later you will be unable to remove uh, unless you take your bike A to a BMW dealer or maybe go to someone with an OBD port diagnostic tool that can then reset it. So then if I show you the operation of the valve, this is fairly straightforward. Um, there is a spring on the top of the outer mechanism that in its normal position ensures the valve is open. But we can manually rotate it and you can see the valve completely closing and completely opening. Now the control of the valve isn't a straightforward open or closed. The servo motor and the ECU can control the valve and open it to different positions at different RPMs. So this is what the valve is doing. So we need to understand what the valve does in terms of its physical operation. Now you can see. Now one more thing to note. In this case, on the GS, the spindle, in other words the shaft, runs vertically from bottom to top. At the bottom here is a sealed bush. There's nothing that we can do and there's no access we have to this bottom bush. But the spindle must 
exit the exhaust at some point for the control mechanism to work at the top. Now some manufacturers have this spindle instead of vertically, they have it horizon horizontally across the exhaust. But then, then that presents a couple of obstacles. Where do you mount this control mechanism? On the GS, for example, we've got very little room on the left-hand side, and if we placed it on the right-hand side, it's quite open and exposed visually and to the elements. And of course, having it on the bottom is completely unpractical on an adventure touring bike, and it would soon get damaged and ripped off your bike. And so this is why in the case of the GS and the GSA, the control mechanism is at the top, out of the way. So now you understand the basic operating principles of the exhaust valve, we need to look at the real reason why manufacturers have to fit these valves in the first place. Now there are two quite often quoted reasons, we need to look at those first. The first one that I often hear is that the valves are installed to help the catalytic converter in its warm-up phase. In other words, to get it up to temperature nice and quickly so it can do its job. Now, technically, there is a bit of truth in that, um, but really, with, uh, with the catalytic converters that first came out a long time ago, they used to take around six to eight minutes to really get up to temperature and to do their job. But on modern catalytic converters with their developments and improving their design, they only take about two or three minutes to warm up and to start the function. So it's not really the correct reason why these valves are there. So that's not true. The second one, which is quite often quoted, um, is that the valve is there to support the mid-range of the motorbike. In other words, the valve is there to help increase torque output during the mid-range or the mid-RPM uh, range of our motorbikes. Now again, there's a bit of an element of truth in there, but it's not the real reason why it's there. Um, it is possible to support the mid-range of a motorbike by having what was originally called back in 1989 an X up valve. But the valve itself is actually mounted much further up the exhaust system, it's right at the bottom of the header pipes, um, and that used a completely different principle. It was there um, to restrict or open the exhaust valve to increase back pressure to improve combustion. Uh, and it was used very, very effectively for those of you like me that were riding bikes back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, in 1989, the FZR1000 X-Up came out. It was a, it was a fabulous bike. Uh, my chosen bike back then was the Suzuki GSX-R 1100, uh, but that had, the FZR had an X-Up valve. So um, after Yamaha had that, the next company that then embodied that same technology was Honda, and then I think Suzuki followed. Um, but you have to understand that engine development has really moved on. I mean, we're talking 30 years ago, and nobody really uses that anymore because engine designers have a lot more tools that they can use to improve mid-range. Uh, and for example, with um, BMW, we now have shift cam technology. It's not a true variable cam timing system because there are only really two operating modes on the inlet uh, cam. There's one profile for low speed or, or, or mid throttle range, and there's a second and low for higher up. Uh, and then Ducati have their own version with proper variable cam timing, uh, and there are lots of other solutions. So to say that this is there to support mid-range or improve, improve torque or output is just not true. So what is the real reason why the manufacturers have to fit these valves? Well, in 2020, Euro 5 came out, uh, and along with it, there were a whole load of new emission rules and regulations. So we need to separate the word emissions for the moment and stay focused on the exhaust valve, because emissions also relate to uh, the gases that come out of our exhaust, and we don't need to talk about those, uh, because there's an, an, another element of the emissions test, which is the noise emissions from our motorbikes. And that is the real reason why these valves have to be fitted. Now for the Euro 5, the, the, and what I'm gonna do, if you look in the video description below, you'll find a link to the full documentation uh, that you can download and print and have a read yourself to do with Euro 5 emissions. Uh, it's quite a complicated read, it's quite a long document and it's not easy to fully understand it. But in essence, there are three tests that our modern bikes that are Euro 5 compliant have to pass. 
The first one is a standing noise test. Uh, and so what they do for that, the bike is up to normal operating temperature. Um, if the bike is capable of more than 5,000 RPM, which in this case for the GS it is, you take the maximum RPM, which is 7,750, you halve that, and with the engine warm, in neutral, clutch engaged, in other words, the clutch levers out, uh, they do an emissions test based on the noise coming from the exhaust at half the maximum RPM. The second test they do is a drive-by test, and I'll, I'll put some pictures up so you can have a look, uh, and that drive-by drive test is in between two fixed points at a set speed, and it again measures the noise output from the exhaust. And there is a third test, and it's called WOT. Now you might be thinking, what Carl, a WOT test? Well, WOT stands for, it's actually W-O-T, Wide Open Throttle Test. Now what they do for that particular test, um, they, they have to measure the noise output in between two points. Um, um, for the bigger bikes, the, the speed testing uh, limit is 50 kilometers an hour. The bike enters the zone, and as it enters the zone, as the front of the bike passes, the bike has to have full throttle applied. And then during a set distance, which isn't actually very far, I think it's only 20 meters, they measure again the noise output from our exhaust. So just to explain what we're looking at down here, this is the tab you're going to be watching, the one I'm touching with the screwdriver. Currently, the tab, which is attached to the valve mechanism, is resting on this part here, which is the stop. So this valve is currently fully open. Now the test we're gonna perform is 3,850 RPM with the bike in neutral and the clutch engaged and the engine up to operating temperature. And this is uh, the requirements for the first test that they do in the Euro five noise emissions tests. So what we're gonna be looking at is this lever here and tracking its relative position turning clockwise. Now what I'm expecting to see is that this will start off somewhere over here at tick over. And then as the RPM inc increases and we get closer to the test figure of 3,850, I'm expecting this to be almost fully closed right over here on the right hand side. Uh, but then as we get past the 4,000 RPM mark, I'm expecting it then to start to close because then it has performed its function of reducing noise during that first part of the test. So let's start the bike and see what happens. So as you can see, the lever has already moved from its stopped, fully open position. So let's slowly increase the RPM. If I need to try and leave the screwdriver here, let's see when the bow starts to move. starting to move at just over 2,000 RPM. It's starting to close. So as we increase the RPM, the valve is closing, 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 closing. So it's now closed. It will take the RPM up to the test limit. Which is approximately here. The valve is closed. Let's take the RPM a little bit higher. And now the valve begins to open. Wow, that's noisy. That is actually quite hard to control that throttle. But what we can see is sort of what we're expecting. Uh, when we start the bike, this valve here, this lever moves to around the mid position. So in other words, the exhaust valve is partially closed. And as we increase the RPM, by the time we get just over 2000 RPM, the valve is starting to move and starting to close even more. And by the time we get to just over 3000 RPM, this valve is closed. But what's interesting is as we move past 
4, 4,200 RPM, the valve begins to open again as the RPM increases. Now, this was the stationary test. We need to go out on the road and see what happens when we're actually riding the bike. Just for clarification, the first gear we're going to test is first gear at 50 kilometers an hour and have a look at the valve. So let's take her up to 50 in first. So I'm gonna use the hoop horn so I can sync up the footages in post-production. So now we're at 50 kilometers an hour in second gear. Again, we're going to have a look at the valve and see what it's doing. So having watched those clips, just in case you're not 100% clear what we've just looked at, let me explain something. When uh, I started planning for this episode, I contacted a couple of manufacturers and asked them would they share with me the gear that the bikes are tested in for the urban or the ride-by test, which is 50 kilometers or 30 miles per hour. <laughs> Nobody wanted to tell me exactly what gear their bikes are in for that test. Um, it's not very clear in the rules and regulations which gear the bikes have to be in. There's a little bit of movement or a li little bit of flexibility in the rules. And each of the manufacturers have their gearing specifically tailored and the engine RPM to be perfectly at the right point for that 50 kilometers or that 30 miles per hour drive-by uh, test to give maximum noise reduction. However, we did find something out. So in the uh, stationary test, which we did here in the garage, at 3,850 RPM, the exhaust valve on the GS or the GSA for the 1250 is as closed as you're ever gonna see it. And in all the testing and all the footage I did, I didn't see the valve close any more than that. So this picture up here, this is as closed as the valve got, and that was at 3,850. And then in uh, first gear, it's clear for the ride-by test that you, they don't use first gear, because in first gear, at 50 kilometers an hour, the engine RPM is approximately 5,000, which means that valve is fully open, providing no noise restriction. But in second gear, this is the gear I think they do their testing, because the engine RPM at 50 kilometers an hour is 3,400. And if we look at the picture of what was happening with the valve, it is in exactly the same position as it was during the stationary test, which is not quite fully closed, but it's as close as I ever saw it during the testing. Uh, and then in the third gear test, um, the engine RPM is I think 2,600 RPM. And although the valve is still operational, so in other words, the exhaust valve is partially closed, it is not as closed as it was in the second gear test. Now, there is one other test that I could have done. <laughs> I did try, which was the wide open throttle test, but with two cameras speaking on the microphone with cones on the road and having to hit my markers and then hit wide open throttle, it, it was a disaster. The first, <laughs> I didn't think, the first time I did that test was in first gear, but I forgot I ride in dynamic mode, which is the, the ride mode, which lets the front wheel come up. So I was looking forward to hitting the wide open throttle and hitting my markers in terms of the distance, whacked open the throttle, <laughs> The front wheel came up, which I wasn't expecting, which scared the life out of me. Uh, so then I put that back into road mode, which keeps that front wheel back on the ground when you're doing that sort of thing. Um, but I still couldn't get any measurable data. Uh, it was way too complicated. I needed really another two people to help me with my distant markers because 20 meters is really a very, very short period of distance when you whack open that throttle because on, the, on these big bikes, they accelerate like absolute rockets from those low speeds. So let's now look at the cause of the problem. In the press and on the forums, the number one thing that everybody points their finger to 
is carbon buildup within, internally, within the exhaust system. It builds up around the top and bottom of those spindles, and that leads to uh, squeaking, sticking, and ultimately seizing. Now, if that was the case, if that assumption was true, what we would find is the data recorded in the workshops to match that assumption. So for example, what we would see for people reporting um, squeaky, partially sticking valves, we would expect to see uh, that on motorbikes across all brands that are around three years old, 50,000 miles, something like that. And then for owners that are reported fully seized valves, the bikes would be older, they might be four to five years old, and they would have more mileage, 60 to 65,000 miles or more. So that is what we'd expect, and if we saw that, that would match the assumption that it could possibly be carbon buildup in the exhaust. <laughs> but that is not the data that we see. There are hundreds and thousands of riders that do 80, 100,000 miles with their motorbikes and they have no trouble, no issue whatsoever, not even a squeak from their exhaust valves. So that's the first anomaly that doesn't match the assumption that it's carbon buildup. The second one is if you look carefully across all of the brands, across all of the forums, you're going to find regular reports from uh, owners with motorbikes that are only a year and a half old, and in some cases they've done less than 6,000 kilometers, which is what, 4,000 miles. And they're reporting partially stuck valves that are bringing up fault codes on their dashboards. So we've got these two extremes that don't match the assumption that it's carbon buildup. Because if it was carbon buildup, motorcyclists in general would not be able to get, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 miles or more without the problems. And uh, the big agencies like the police bikes and the ambulance bikes, they'd all be having problems at a fixed mileage. So this doesn't support the assumption that it is primarily a carbon-based buildup that's causing the problem. Then if we then, include into that my experience and the experience of a lot of mechanics not only working on cars but motorbikes too um, what we find is it's not carbon or not solely carbon carbon can be involved in that process especially if a rider uses their bike for only city town driving and they really don't use very much of that rpm if it is possible to have excessive carbon build up within the exhaust but that generally isn't a problem so clearly something else is happening here. You'll find that the number one culprit is corrosion, which is water-based. Now there is quite a lot of debris that is thrown up from the road onto our bikes, especially in the rain. It's not only water, but it's all the, the chemicals and the debris and the dirt and the grit on the roads that get thrown up and it eventually works its way into the area around this exhaust valve. And also just bear in mind one thing, on the rear of the bike, we've got a mud guard. It's a fairly basic thing to stop water spraying on our passengers on the rear and the number plate. But also what's missing uh, from new is any kind of water protection that stops the spray spraying forwards across the bike. And when I picked this up from new, the first time I used it in the rain, my legs got soaked. So the first thing I did was order um, the equivalent of a mud sling. It wasn't actually a mud sling as the brand that I used, uh, but some sort of a protector that stops that water spray moving up <laughs> over our shock absorbers, which are very expensive, and the rest of the bike. But it also protects the exhaust valve. Now, I don't have access to all the data, so I can't tell you if people that fit these in general have much less reported incidences of squeaky sticking valves, but I think that is gonna play quite an important role to help him pre pre prevent water getting into that top valve bush. Now, one more thing. There will be people that say, well, I'm one of those owners. I've only had my bike for a year and a half and did very low mileage and my bike is sticking and I don't use it in the rain. Probably true, but I bet you wash your bikes. How many of you actually take the time when you've washed and cleaned your bikes to take this off and clean it thoroughly? And then when you've done that, get the bike up to temperature and go for a 10 minute ride before you put your bike away in the garage. Very few of you. And it is really important if you're really serious 
about keeping your bike in good condition once you've cleaned it and you've got lots of water everywhere you really should be getting the bike warm take it for a short ride and all of that water that's collected in all the different uh, parts and the different compartments around the bike will come off with vibration and shaking and lean angle and then when you come back most of that water is gone and in particular with the exhaust system uh, there'll be no more water sitting around that exhaust valve that can start the corrosion in the first place so that goes some way to explain why some of the owners uh, with very low mileages still have this corrosion problem uh, but they don't use their bikes in the rain and it probably is something to do with their washing procedure anyway let's have a look at the maintenance that we can do to help prevent the problem So what you see here, these are the tools and the products that we're gonna use in the next section of this video. So let me just go through these. But first, the one thing that is out of place in this picture is ACF 50. Now I've included this in here because so many people get this wrong. ACF 50 is an amazing product. I use it, thousands of people use it. It is absolutely brilliant for its intended purpose, but it is no good for our exhaust valves. So it's a complete waste and it's potentially dangerous because it doesn't have a high enough temperature rating. So don't be using ACF 50 for this project. So starting with the tools over here, ratchet screwdriver, short screwdriver, TX25. Then we need two 10 millimeter open-ended spanners. We need a TX40, a 3.8 ratchet, a 13 millimeter socket and a 3.8 extension bar. So these are the tools that we need for the removal of the parts that we need to take off to give us access to the cleaning. And then here, these are just some of the tools that you can use. This probably is the most important one. You want a flat blade screwdriver that has a tip that is four millimeters wide. And you'll see why when we get to the section where we spread the spring apart so that we can see inside the top spindle. So this is an important screwdriver. And then a selection of screwdrivers for the cleaning and a selection of brushes, which I'll show you when we get to that section. Now, these two here, these are, these are actually out of my electronics kit. They're four cleaning PCB connections and um, electrical connections. Now, this one is actually quite important. It is only, when it's not worn like this, um, a couple of millimeters wide, and it's going to be great for getting into the gaps that we're going to see later on in the video. I probably won't need to use it today, but if your bike's done a lot of mileage and there's a lot of crud in there, you might not be able to get access to it even with this selection of brushes. Maybe something like this will help you. So I'm just gonna show you these in addition. And then to the products that we're going to use. We're going to use copper paste, copper paste with the screws and bolts when we're doing the reassembly to ensure they don't seize at a later date. And in terms of freeing off uh, and lubricants, you could use WD-40, but I, I, I'm not associated or sponsored with any of these guys. Um, but it, it, generally, I try not to use either one of those because I don't want to introduce more problems. Normally, I find something like these copper sprays. Now, there are lots of different brands that make these copper sprays. If I was to choose one, it would probably be Fermit. Not that I'm associated with them, but it's, it really is a professional product. Uh, it's used in all kinds of industry applications. And the thing that it has over most other products is it's rated up to 1400 degrees C. Um, the normal stuff you can buy is also equally good. I mean, I have different tins in different workshops in different toolkits. So this is just what I happen to have at home today. This one's rated at 1200 degrees. I've got another one that's rated at 1100 degrees. Uh, and so you want something over a thousand degrees C in terms of its maxi maximum temperature rating. So these are the tools and the products that we're gonna to use today. Let's get started. So how we progress with the preventative maintenance really depends on the condition of your motorbike, the mileage you've done, and what you want to achieve. So the taking the rear silencer off isn't always really necessary. The minimum that we need to remove is this heat shield here, which is held on by one, two, three Torx 25s. There is a second plastic cover, which sits on top of the mechanism itself, which is again a TX25 here and a TX25 at the back. But if you wish to, if your valve is really sticking or partially seized, then we also need to remove this 13 millimeter nut here and use a TX40 up here on the exhaust hanger so that we can take this silencer completely off. So I'll remove everything, but I just wanna be clear, for, for most people, you can get away with just taking the heat shield off and this plastic cover. So let's have a look and see what we need to do. 
So the tools we need to remove these two parts are a screwdriver with a TX25 and a short stubby screwdriver uh, with a quarter inch drive on the top so that we can transfer the drive onto the short screwdriver. Or in fact, you might have a short screwdriver with a TX25 already on it. So all we're going to do is remove these three So we've got our three screws, they're all the same so we can't get these back in the wrong location. And then this cover gently just comes off out the way. So now we've got this black plastic housing. So this is when we take the T25, we move it from the big screwdriver to the small one. And again, So once those screws are removed, this cap just lifts off. We're gonna lift it vertically off and it comes off just like that. So now we've got access to our valve mechanism on the top. Or let me also show you how we take the exhaust off. Now down here, we've got a 13 millimeter, which is the first thing that we need to remove. This can sometimes be quite tight. Now the trick with this is, is to undo the nut all the way to the end, but don't take it off. And then this bracket here, it is located right at the top. There's a little tiny nibble, and in fact, what I'll do, I'll move the camera and show you. So I've repositioned the camera. We've got the nut almost to the end of the threaded part of the bolt, but what we need to pay attention to is up here. There's a little tiny lip on this bracket here, and it locates in a little cutout. We can see the cutout here, there's another one on this side. So the bracket itself, we're gonna take our fingers and we're going to spread it apart at the bottom, and then we're gonna move it backwards. And it doesn't take an awful lot. Give it a waggle and it will yeah, start to move. And if I rotate that round like so, now you can see there's a cutout on this side and a cutout on this side. The important part is this cutout here needs to locate in this lug here when we refit it. So again, just to be clear, to, to, to loosen this off, we've actually spread it apart and moved it back. So the next part we need to remove, I need to reposition the camera and use the TX40. So now we've loosened the clamp and moved it backwards. Now we can move on to this TX40 at the top. Um, these really aren't very tight most of the time. Uh, and there are really just three parts for this bolt assembly. So there's a bolt, which is like so. There is the aluminium cap, and then behind here, once I start to move the exhaust, there is a very thin uh, metal washer, which will probably fall out. Now, the very first time you take this exhaust off, it can be very tricky. And I know some people that do this at home can spend 10, 20 minutes trying to get this end can off. But let me just share this with you. The, the easiest thing to do, we don't want to pass stress along the rest of the exhaust system. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna place my hand here and grip it firmly. And at the same time, I'm gonna be holding the end can up here at the very end, and I'm going to wiggle backwards and forwards ever so slightly. I'm over exaggerating with my hand movement. I'm only gonna move it about a centimeter backwards and forwards, left and right, and up and down. And what that does, it spreads open the connection down here, and that will enable us to use two hands and then remove the exhaust in one swift, firm movement. So first of all, I'm gonna grip here because I don't wanna transfer any stress to the exhaust. And then if you watch this area, in particular here, we're gonna start wiggling. That's the little metal washer, left and right, up and down. Okay, so that's all we need to do to start off with. Then I'm gonna hold this area here with my hand and I'm gonna pull the exhaust rearward while wiggling up and down. Okay, that came off very easily. Sometimes they're a lot more difficult to do than that. Uh, sometimes they do have quite a bit of dirt and grit around this connection point here. Now, while I've got it all off, I'll just share with you one tip for reassembling. So when we go to reassemble it, you probably heard that washer hit the floor. So what we're going to do, we're gonna take the nut and the cap and this thin washer that fell on the floor. And for the reassembly process, what we need to do, or what I find is much easier, is to refit. 
the cap like so. I'll turn it around and then this washer here, I'm going to remount, lift that up a bit clearer, onto that bolt. And that makes it much easier to mount that back on. So then when we refit the exhaust, when we've finished all of our work, that little washer, look up here at the very top, if we then gently waggle that back into place, there's much less chance of, let me find the TX40. Okay, there's much less chance of that washer up here falling out. If you don't do that, you could spend several minutes trying to get that washer in place. So that was my tip for refitting. So let me take it off so that we can move on. That washer will probably fall out again. Waggling and lift it out. Okay, so the silence is off. Use an old cushion um, or some rags to place this on because it will scratch very easily on the garage floor. So then we can move on to looking at the mechanism itself. So now we've got our covers off, we can now have good access and good visibility to the top pulley and these control cables. So we do need to move, remove the control cables before we start trying to do any lubrication because you're not gonna get any free movement on this top pulley until we disconnect the cables. So we're gonna need two 10 millimeter spanners. So we're gonna hold the back. This one here, we're gonna hold that steady. We're gonna take our other 10 millimeter spanner, go in from the top, a little bit more. Okay, so then we're gonna spin the nuts almost off, but not completely off those threaded parts so that they're ready to unhook. Now this next bit is fairly easy. We're going to take this cable and pull it backwards ever so slightly and lift that cable out. Do the same on the rear one and lift it out. Now, bear in mind, these cables run in a groove in this pulley. And it's an important, it's a good idea for you to have a good, clean understanding of where these cables need to go. So if you're not sure, take a picture during disassembly. Now, in terms of disconnecting, what we need to do is the back cable first. This makes the process much easier. And filming and doing this is not easy. And if we gently unhook that, there we go, that's actually come off very easily. That is now out the way. Now the tricky one is this forward one. Do not, under any circumstances, be tempted to use a pair of pliers, something like this, because these cables will start to fray if you start grabbing these and twisting these. So do not use those. So what we actually, what I find is the easiest way to do it is actually partially rotate this valve around here like this and then gently unhook it with your fingers and it will, there we go, just lift straight out. If you try and take it out here, it is really tricky and you can spend five or 10 minutes to try and take it out. When in fact, all you really need to do is rotate this pulley round here and try and take it out on the other side. For some reason, it's much easier over there. So now we've got the cables off and we can move on to the lubrication and the rest of the project. Now you can't use, for, for example, oil. I know a lot of people have used oil, but the problem when you use oil on a spindle on an exhaust is when that oil gets really hot, it carbonizes. And in effect, it leaves a, a, a sticky residue, which eventually works its way into the spindle and just seizes everything up. So regular engine oil or any kind of oil in that regard, you can't use. Looking inside my exhaust of a bike just under two years old, 10,000 kilometers, there is negligible buildup of soot or carbon deposits. And when we look very, very carefully at this bottom spindle, there is, there is nothing, there's nothing there that's gonna cause any problems. Now, when I look at bikes I service and maintain, I can tell you they look very, very similar to this. Even with 40, 50,000 miles on them, there virtually is no difference. Now, if I take my finger, I did wipe it a moment ago, if, if I take my, my clean finger and I scrape it really hard inside there, Look at that. There's virtually nothing on that in terms of carbon or soot deposits. And this is what I find on most motorbikes. Now, providing your bike is used correctly and you're at least once a month using the full RPM range, which is you know from tick over all the way up to almost maximum RPM, you're gonna keep the inside of your exhaust 
healthy and functioning correctly. And you're not gonna have carbon buildup or carbon deposits. So I I'm pretty sure with, with all the years I've been working on cars, motorbikes and commercial vehicles, the problem is where this vertical spindle exits the exhaust on the control mechanism because the, the, the shaft has to exit the top up here at some point for the control mechanism to be mounted. And it is this point here where water can get into that top bush, and that is the, primarily the cause of the problem. I, I think, I have to say in all honesty, if you were to drive around you know, at less than 4,000 RPM on a, on a modern motorbike that's supposed to be doing double that in terms of its maximum RPM, Theoretically, you could have much more soot and carbon deposits building up inside your exhaust, but that really isn't the way we're supposed to be riding our modern motorbikes. There normally is a bit of up and down movement in that shaft. So first of all, if you have a look up here and you have a listen, you'll hear that shaft moving up and down. Now we got probably just under a millimeter of travel at the top. And importantly, if we look at the bottom here and you watch down in here when we do that, you can see that shaft ever so slightly moving up and down. And that's brilliant. That, that's really gonna help us at the moment. When we start the lubrication process up here, we're going to rotate this pulling mechanism uh, with it currently pushed upwards. Because if you watch, you push down, it'll always spring back up. So we can do several rotations like this. And then what we can do is we can push down on this pulling mechanism and do those same rotations. And that will help transfer that high temperature lubricant that we're going to use up here to move down into the bush assembly. So then we would push down, have a listen, and then we would rotate it with a bit of downwards pressure. And those two movements, when we get round to lubricating, will help transfer that high temperature lubricant into that upper bush. So now we're ready for the preventative maintenance. We've got our covers removed, we've got both of our control cables removed, and now we can get on with some lubrication. Now, as you can see, my end can is still removed, but I'll just repeat, it, for, for the bikes that don't have any real problems currently, and it's not squeaking and it's not partially sticking, there really is no need to remove the end can. And quite often, even with partially sticking valves, you can get away without taking the end can off and just performing what I'm going to show you. But there is a common mistake that a lot of people make. When people have problems, they tell me they took these covers off and they've lubricated it and it's made no difference. <laughs> and quite often, this is what they do wrong. So this screwdriver here, this is a flat blade screwdriver with a tip that is four millimeters wide. If we place the screwdriver under the bottom of the spring and rotate, rotate it 90 degrees like so, what this gives us access to underneath, it shows us that there is in fact a metal collar that runs all the way around this base. And so spraying lubricant down here on this bottom edge has absolutely zero effect because it's not getting to the part that we want to reach, which is in fact the vertical shaft running through the exhaust. Now that collar is part of this bottom plate here, which is part, all of this is part of that collar inside there. So spraying lubricant at the bottom is pointless. So what we actually need to do is remove our screwdriver and replace it and then position it approximately halfway up and then turn it 90 degrees. Now, hopefully the camera is gonna give us access to this. Inside here, you might just better make it out. You can then see the shiny shaft. This is the shaft that is moving up and down vertically within the exhaust. And that's what the butterfly valve is attached to. And that is the actual part that we need to lubricate. Um, and I, I can't, I'll try and move that one more time so you can see the bottom collar. Hopefully, We'll try that. And if you look inside there, you might just make out the bottom lip and still see part of the shiny shaft inside. And I'll have to look back at this footage and make sure if I've got it clear enough. But this is the space in, into which we need to spray our lubricant. And what we're going to use is a high temperature copper based lubricant. So with regards to actually cleaning inside here, in this gap in between the spring, it's not very easy. You're going to need to use a combination of tools. So this little tiny small 
stainless steel wire brush, you can, and it is hard for me to film this and show you at the same time, you can get in there and give that a clean. And you're gonna to have to constantly work your way around, moving the position of the screwdriver, bear in mind that's a four millimeter tip, and then using a combination of um, a small wire brush like this, and maybe a couple of different size screwdrivers to get in there and very carefully take any deposits that you find inside. Now, most people won't have compressed air, but compressed air is a really good idea for getting rid of the loosened deposits once you've given it a good scrub. So I'll just repeat one more time, It's going I can't film it because it's hard to do it, film it and do it at the same time, is work your way all the way around from different sides and try and get in there as much as you can to clean out that space between where that shiny shaft is, which is what that is inside there, and then that collar which is right at the bottom here. So once it's cleaned, we can get on with the spraying, which I'll show you next. So this is actually very difficult for me to do while I'm filming and I've got a light source and I'm gonna show you the products I use in a moment and we're just gonna spray. Okay, that was literally a little tiny spray. And although we've got quite a lot of it up here, we can move it onto and hopefully the camera will have picked up that once shiny shaft in the middle there has now got that copper slip on it. So what we can then do is release the screwdriver, take it out and remember we said we can do this up and down movement with the shaft. We're then going to rotate Okay, so even with my exhaust that wasn't really sticking any way in any way whatsoever, just by doing that, just by placing some very small amount of that copper slit lubricant in there, you can really notice a difference. So once you've worked it backwards and forwards, you can have a look inside there again. And if you find that the shaft is then shiny, you can then reapply a small amount of that lubricant and do that whole process again. Now you might find you're gonna to have to work this backwards and forwards for several minutes. You know, four or five minutes of up and down movement and backwards and forwards movement in the first place. Now, sometimes there is a benefit to using uh, something like a freeing agent, maybe WD-40, in there first. But if you are going to do that, what I suggest you do in here is place a rag, get it completely in the left and the right-hand side of that valve, and stop that lubricant running all the way down into the bottom of the shaft, and I'll explain why in a moment. So I would put the rag left and right in there, and maybe you want to do some freeing off with a freeing lubricant first. But once you've done that, you need to give that a good half an hour before you start applying this um, copper slip lubricant, because this is the stuff that we really want to get onto the shaft, because WD-40, within minutes of starting the bike, that will all be gone because it's not heat resistant. Whereas this stuff that we're using here is safe to use up to about 12, 1400 degrees C, which is jolly hot, and our exhaust at this point is not gonna exceed that temperature. So I just mentioned about the shaft on the bottom. Uh, as we talked about earlier, the bottom of the shaft down here is sealed. So any lubricant that we spray on that bottom bearing, guess where it's gonna go? Down into this capped enclosure underneath here. Now, you might think spraying WD-40 is a good idea to try and free off that bottom bearing. And, and, and in a way, it, it might work. But also what it's gonna do, it's gonna take any debris, any deposits that are in there that you haven't cleaned off thoroughly down past the shaft, deeper into that bearing. And that is not what we want to do. Um, because in an ideal world, when we're using something like GT85 or WD-40, we want an exit point so that those lubricants that can then pass through whatever we're trying to free off. So on the top bush, that's fine, because we're going to spray it in the top and hopefully it will work its way out inside here. And that's why we're going to use the rag. So on the top, it's perfectly acceptable to use that to start the freeing off process. But I personally wouldn't use it on the bottom because all it's gonna do is collect debris and take it deeper inside the bush, which further on is gonna to lead to more sticking. So anyway, now we know what to do, we can start the reassembly. So one more thing just to highlight, 
If you do feel there is a need to use a wire brush inside here on these upper and lower bushes, maybe your, your valve has completely seized solid and you feel the need to do this, then obviously a traditional wire brush, something like this isn't gonna work because they're too big and they're not gonna fit in there. So what you'll need to get is something like this. These, this is a stainless steel wired small brush. Um, they're approximately six to eight millimeters wide. And this sort of thing, you can pick them up in hardware stores or buy them online and Amazon, for example, and they're very, very useful this, for this sort of job. And then what you would do is reach inside and then pull forward as you're scrubbing. And then you can do this on both the lower and the upper bush. Just bear in mind, once you have done that, you're gonna have lots of loose debris inside your exhaust. So don't use an airline to try and blow it out because all you're going to do is blow all of that debris inside towards the catalytic converter. That's not a good idea. So what we're going to do is before we refit the exhaust silencer, uh, we can start the bike and then all of, those, uh, all of that debris inside here will blow outwards. Just bear in mind what I said earlier on, you cannot start your bike with these uh, control cables disconnected. So in that case, you would wait until everything is reassembled, you have double checked to make sure it's all connected correctly, and before you fit the silencer, start the bike, run it for a couple of minutes, and that will blow all of that debris from the inside out. And you may find you want to try that. So reassembly, sometimes it is incredibly simple and goes very well, sometimes it can be quite tricky. So we need to make sure that we've kept these separate throughout the project so we can't get these on the, in the correct uh, slots on the pulley. We're going to start with the most difficult one, which is this front one. Now, when we took these apart, if you go back and look at the video, what we actually did is we took this pulley and we rotated it all the way around here. But on reassembly, <laughs> strangely, I find it much better not to do that. So we're gonna take the brass nipple and we're gonna gently place it in the hole, in the pulley, like so. And then, it is really hard to film and do this. And then gently, with a little bit of pressure, using your finger, there we go, it just slides over and the cable goes into that groove. And hopefully you can see the shiny cable running through the groove and that nipple is now in the correct place. So then we can do the same with the rear one. The rear one is normally much easier to do. Slide that nipple in first, rotate it, and then pull the cable through so that the cable then can also run through those two grooves. So the next part is also quite easy. We need to refit these into their mounts. We're gonna start with the back one. All we're going to do is we're gonna take this outer part and move it backwards with a little bit of pressure, but we need to make sure that this cable runs inside that pulley. So starting at this edge with my finger, I'm gonna make sure that's in, then pull it backwards and gently drop it in to its locating lug. Same with the front cable. Make sure that this silver inner part is sit situated inside the pulley. I'm gonna use my thumb, lift it, take this and push backwards and then drop that over the U-shaped clamp place on both sides. So now we're ready to tighten everything back up. So wiggle these right down to the bottom so that they're not at the top, they're as far down as you can get them, and you'll see that quite easily, and then spin the nuts like so. We then need to use our two 10 millimeter spanner. So we'll try and do the back one We do not need to do these nuts up any more tighter. And BMWs are telling, telling us that in the first place because these nuts aren't very deep. They're only mm, three millimeters at best in terms of their thickness. So that's it. So just make sure that the inner cable is running inside that groove where my fingernail is pointing to and that these nipples are fitted correctly. So now we can move on with the rest of the reassembly. So another thing to point out, uh, my cables are completely free. There's no sticking with these inner cables here, the shiny part, moving inside these outer sleeves. But this is a good point if your bike has done 40, 50,000 miles, it probably isn't a bad idea to put some spray lubricant inside here. So we're going to spray it in between the inner 
and the outer collar so that it goes deep inside here and ultimately works its way down through this cable. Uh, mine aren't sticking, I'm not gonna do it, but you also have that option for both of these to put some lubricant in there. So what we're looking at here, this is the front, lower, right-hand side of the bike. This is, this black unit here, is the servo motor. The servo motor is connected directly to these two cables I'm pointing to with a screwdriver. And they are the two cables that go rearward and connect to the exhaust valve. Now it's important to note this connection here, this is nothing to do with the servo motor. This is the oxygen sensor for the front right hand side downpipe. The connector that we're interested in is this one here I'm pointing to with the screwdriver. So if you decide to delete the actuation or the operation of your uh, exhaust valve, you are going to need to remove this. There are one, two, and there's a third screw at the top. The, all three of them are TX25. The servo motor itself moves forwards, backwards, and then you have to wiggle it out. It's fairly easy to do. But this is the connector here that you would then connect your servo eliminator module to. So chapter three, delete it, remove it, disconnect the cables, or just leave it alone. So the first one I want to talk about briefly is disconnecting cables. I mentioned this earlier on in the episode. Uh, it has a lot to do with whether your bike is Euro 3, 4 or 5 compliant. There is something called OBD1 and OBD2, onboard diagnostics. And you've probably heard of something called CAN bus, the CAN bus systems, which is the way the bike communicates with all the different sensors on the bike. If you imagine a CAN bus system, is, let's give you an example, we we'll call that the telephones. That's the physical telephone handsets. That's the way that the bike communicates. OBD1 and OB2, OBD2 is the language in which we would use or speak on those telephones. So these are two different things, CAN bus, and then on the top is the form of language in which the systems communicate. So with OBD1, things were no, they're not basic, but they were much simpler than they currently are with Euro 5 bikes, which have to be OBD2. So with the, what that means is with, with the earlier bikes that had OBD1, you could, in fact, on some bikes, disconnect the cables, go for a ride, and then check out for yourself and find out very simply and very easily, is there a benefit to deleting or removing the exhaust valve? For sure, it would show up an error message on your dashboard, but then when you reconnected your cables when you got home and you start your bike up and go for your ride, the ECU would say, oh, everything's working okay, and turn the light out. <laughs> that doesn't happen on OBD2, which is Euro 5 compliant bikes. Uh, if you get an error message by disconnecting the cables, that error message is not gonna go out. Even if you reconnect your cables, you're gonna have to take your bike back to BMW and ask them nicely and explain what you were doing in the first place to get them to turn out that warning light. Um, also, the level of communication between the sensor systems on the bike and the ECU is much more detailed. It's a much firmer handshake between the sensor or whichever sensor it is on the bike, whatever system, and the ECU. And in the case of the servo motor, that controls the exhaust valve, the ECU is expecting very, very specific voltage values to be constantly sent from the servo motor to the ECU so that the ECU can be sure that it's working all of the time. Um, and then with regards to deleting it, this is quite an interesting one. For the GS, with all the testing I've done, there is no benefit to adding a delete valve module. You know, one of those modules that you plug into the servo motor. I, I can't see any benefit whatsoever on the R1250 GS or the GSA. There may be one or two horsepower gained. I'm sure some of you have done a rolling road test or had your bike tested to find out exactly what the differences are, but I would imagine it's gonna be very, very small, if anything at all. And that's because we already have shift cam technology where BMW use those um, inlet cam profiles, there's two different profiles for different engine speeds and it does a fantastic job. And I don't have any issues with throttle control or the speed at which you can roll on that throttle in a very controlled way and hold a constant throttle at low RPM. It is fabulous. It's one of the, one of the plus points for the GS. So for me, there's no benefit on this particular bike. However, I'll put a link at the end of this video, which is to my Multistrada. That was a 2013-2014 Twin Spark 1200 Multistrada. And on that bike, the benefit 
of installing a delete mechanism, or in my case, I actually ground off the screws that hold that circular butterfly to that spindle and removed it completely. The benefits were huge. They were, it really was a night and day modification. Uh, and so for me, when we're doing this sort of upgrade, we have to weigh, we have to balance several things, cost and benefits, against any negatives that we might come across. So with regards to doing um, a, a servo delete on the GS, the benefit I think is negligible and the cost is not all, an awful lot, but the negative is we then made our bikes much more noisy for the stationary test. And as you're probably well aware of, if you watch and you read motorcycling news, the police are doing a lot more on the side of the road testing of our bikes. And if your bike is noisy, guess what's gonna happen? And this is also happening here in Europe too. Uh, so, but in the case of the